All right, welcome back to the Double Play channel where I show you how you can put your money to work in two places at one time by leveraging the cash value of a maximum overfunded life insurance policy. So if you've been researching how to invest in real estate using life insurance, you've come to the right place. So go down to the description right now and hit the thumbs up button and be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you're notified whenever I come out with more videos. And if you're just finding this, be sure to go back and look at my channel to find out what other videos you might be interested in watching. So today we're gonna to be talking about the internal rate of return and why I don't think that it's a good metric to use when you're evaluating a maximum overfunded life insurance policy for investing in real estate. Um, very often, uh, potential clients that I'm working with will ask me to run a report showing the IRR. And, and when I hear that, it makes me think that I've got to go back and do some more work with that client because they don't quite get the concept of the double play. The double play is not about the life insurance. The double play is about having a store of cash that you have access to or you can leverage that you can use to invest in real estate, which is the real investment. So the double play is really the combination of the return that you're getting on your cash value. So you're concerned about getting the most cash value for the premiums that you're taking, getting, paying. <laughs> um, and being able to have as much cash value to leverage into real estate as you can possibly get. That's how you maximize your wealth using the double play. So what I'm gonna do in this video is show you what the IRR is, why it's not a good metric, and then I'm gonna show you what you should be looking at instead. So if that sounds interesting, stick around after the intro and we'll get started. All right, thanks for sticking around. I'm Tom Rutkowski with Innovative Retirement Strategies and this is the Double Play Channel. I created this channel many years ago to give you a source of information on investing in real estate using life insurance. And I know how hard it can be to look for information on the internet because a lot of sites are very fluffy and they really want you to trade your email address for the opportunity to talk to one of their salespeople before they give you any information. I'm putting it all out there for free because I'm pretty confident that you wanna work with a knowledgeable expert. The goal of this channel is to give you all of the tools that you need without ever talking to a life insurance agent to make the most informed decision you can. You shouldn't need to talk to me or any other life insurance agent, any other qualified life insurance agent, until you're ready to see what the numbers look like for yourself or you're just tired of watching all my videos, one or the other. But if you do have questions, be sure to post them in the comments section down below where everybody can see them so that everybody can benefit from the answers that I provide. And I usually get back to pretty quickly on things. So, all right, to get back to the topic, we're gonna to be talking about the internal rate of return and why I don't think that it's a useful metric for evaluating a maximum overfunded life insurance policy for the double play. So I'm gonna explain what the IRR is. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of a minimally funded policy and a maximum overfunded policy to show you how two policies from the exact same company, exact same uh, person insured, are gonna have two vastly different IRRs, even though they're, they're paying the same exact premium. And then finally, I'm gonna wrap things up by just talking about what you should be looking at instead. All right, but before we get started, I've gotta take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one, I just wanna make sure that you understand that this channel is purely educational. There's no tax advice, no financial advice, no legal advice being offered. I simply wanna give you the tools that you need to understand how to utilize life insurance for investing in real estate or whatever you want to do with it. And secondly, I want you to understand that the primary purpose of life insurance is for the death benefit protection. Any other benefit is purely ancillary. So let's get started. I want to explain what an internal rate of return is so that you are all on the same page here. And the internal rate of return is 
the return that your investment should make when you smooth it all out to account for return variability. And the best way to understand or visualize it would be to picture yourself buying uh, an apartment complex with multiple units in it. And you have to buy it first, so you've got a, a big outlay of cash. And then let's just say there's five different buildings and you take them on one at a time to rehab them and then put them online and do with a higher revenue. So your business model is going to show the, the initial outlay. It's going, there's going to be revenue because those units are being rent, uh, rented out, but there's also going to be periodic investments as you remodel each of the units. So when you, and then each time the unit is done, I'm sorry, you're gonna have a little bit higher revenue from that point on. So at some point in the future, you wanna look back and be able to say, or from the beginning, you wanna look out 10 years and say, what is my rate of return? Or what was my rate of return? What would my return have been with, despite all the lumpy revenues that we have and the lumpy expenses and investment that we have? So what the internal rate of return does is it basically discounts all of those back to the present and, and sets that discount rate, which would make everything zero. And then really what that does is it shows you what the, the, the rate of return that you would need to earn to get from point A to point B if it weren't so lumpy. If you had just invested all your money at one time and earned, say, 13%, you would have got from point A to point B. So hopefully that's clear. I went into a lot of visual detail, despite, you know, you, you can always go online and, and get the definition of an internal rate of return. But if you don't know what it is, um, sometimes it's easier to get an example that puts it into visual terms for you. So I probably beat that subject to death, so I'm gonna move on. All right, so why do I believe that the internal rate of return is a useless metric for investing or for life insurance when you're intending to use a maximum overfunded life insurance policy to invest in real estate. And really, one, getting back to the, to the definition of, of an IRR, it's, it's to evaluate the performance of an investment. And certainly life insurance is not an investment. But that's, that's not what you came here to learn. Um, what I wanna show you here is, is I wanna take a look at two different policy designs. Both are going to have the exact same premium. You can assume it's from the exact same company with the exact same dividend rates, the exact same insured we're looking at. We're going to be looking at a 45 year old, healthy, non-smoker. And we're gonna design one policy that's minimally funded where we're trying to get the maximum death benefit that we can get for the amount of premium that we're paying. And the other one is going to be a maximum overfunded where we're designing that policy for the least bit of death benefit that you can possibly and legally purchase and still meet the minimum definition of life insurance. So let's take a look at what these look like. All right, so this first chart that we're looking at is for a minimally funded life insurance policy. So this is a life insurance policy where the death benefit is maximized. This person wants to get as much death benefit as they can get for their $20,000 of premium. And this table is showing you the internal rate of returns for the first 20 policy years and based on the surrender value and based on the death benefit. And just, you know, going on a side note here, the, looking at the IRR on the death benefit is, is really the way you should be using a life insurance, an IRR if you're going to be analyzing a life insurance policy. You know, if you're, if you're putting $20,000 a year into something, you know, you want to know what would be the return if something happened to me and how much money would I be leaving to my heirs. So first thing to take note from this minimally funded policy is because of the high death benefit, and it's not shown here, it's, but it's uh, just a hair over $2 million, there's a lot of cost that's coming out of that $20,000 that needs to, you know, money needs to be pooled into a pool to pay all of the expected claims for all of the 45 you know, year olds who aren't going to make it to 46 that year. And each year that basically starts over again. 
And as the cash value increases, the amount of insurance or risk that's in the policy goes down. And I'll circle back and show that visually here in a bit. But one thing I want you to see is if we look at the, you know, the center column there, the surrender value IRR, you can see that it is negative for the first 17 years before it even turns positive. Oh my, no, I'm sorry, 19 years, not 17. It's not until the very last year, the 20th year, that it's showing a positive IRR. And that's because we don't really care what the IRR is on the cash value if we're buying the policy for the death benefit. Now, at the same time, if you look across to the death benefit IRR, you can see that it starts off very high because if you simply put one $20,000 premium into the policy and you happen to, you know, the insured happened to die that year, you know, if you're the policy owner and you're the insured, you know, certainly you have a disincentive to take advantage of life insurance policy. Um, so I don't know how to best phrase that, but if you paid it $20,000 or made a $20,000 investment per se, and you suddenly made $2 million that year, you would have a very high annualized rate of return or IRR. And then each year as your investment in that goes up, you can see that your internal rate of return is going down. And mainly because you're, you're receiving that $2 million death benefit five years out in the future. So you would have, would have had the benefit of investing $100,000 over those five years. So that's what the minimally funded policy looks like. So now let's take a look at what a maximum overfunded policy design looks like. Same $20,000 premium, same policy, same insured. We're just looking for a minimum death benefit now. All right, so on this graph, we should see, you know, we're basically looking at the same 45 year old, the same $20,000 of premium. Only now the surrender value is considerably higher because it's a maximum overfunded policy design. And I, I should also note here that usually when I do a policy design for the double play, I'm putting on what's called an early values rider, which waives the surrender charges so that in the first 10 years of the policy, the cash value is equal to the surrender value. Um, what's not shown here is what the cash value actually is. So this is showing you what you would get back if you surrendered the policy, but the true cash value is, is much higher than that. It's probably closer to $17,000, not nine. So those numbers that you're seeing for the first 10 years aren't representative of how much cash value is in the policy. It's how much you would get back or how much you could borrow if you were to turn in the policy or borrow against it. So nonetheless, if you compare that against the, the previous graph, that chart table that we, <laughs> that we looked at, um, you can see that the surrender value is still negative in the beginning year, but it's only negative through the sixth policy year before it turns positive and it starts increasing every year thereafter. And when I, you see the graph here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically take the data that's in these two tables and I'm gonna put it into a graph side by side so that you can see what the numbers look like um, get from a visual perspective. But basically, as the cash value increases and the death benefit is held to that, um, it's, I should have said, it, it's about a $300,000 death benefit in this case compared to the $2 million that we had on the other one. But each year that you're putting $20,000 of premium into the policy, there's basically $17,000 resulting from that that's going towards the cash value. You know, you're losing $3,000 to the expenses of the policy. But over time, the death benefit is really, you know, still that $300,000 plus all the cash value that you have. So you could have a $2 million death benefit, um, but $1.7 million of that is cash value. And when you get there, you know, if you, if you assume that the seven, the, that $1.7 million is earning, say, 5.5% of, of interest crediting or dividends, and it's only the, you know, your, your premium is not, you know, the IRR is going to approach that return that the, the, the policy is earning or the cash value is earning. So you'll see that IRR increase almost up to the interest crediting or dividend rate as time goes on. But again, it's, it's never going to be the same. And frankly, it, it doesn't matter 
What matters is that we have cash that we can leverage to invest in something. So we, we want a policy with, we want, when we're putting in $20,000 of premium, we want a policy that has $17,000 of cash value. So we can leverage the most money and put it to work in two places. All right, so going across, um, if you look at the death benefit, um, the IR here is, is much lower because we're investing much more and the potential return is, is lower. So that is what it is. I mean, we want that to be as low as possible. So let me just kind of explain, you know, so I, I've, I've shown you two examples now, same exact policy, just two different policy designs, and each one results in vastly different internal rates of return. And I just want to, I want to make the point here what matters in a maximum overfunded life insurance policy is how much cash value you get from each premium that you're putting into the policy. So in this $20,000 premium example, we're getting about $17,000 of cash value. Now, if we could go to a bank and get a line of credit with, uh, assume there's no loan to value discount, you're, you've got $17,000 of cash value and you've got access to a loan of $17,000. So you've got $34,000 that could potentially go to work for you. Now, if the policy design is not as good, it's not, not at 85%, then you maybe let's just say it's uh, $16,000 of cash value out of that $20,000 premium. Well, now you've got that 16,000 plus another $16,000 line of credit and that's $32,000. So you don't have as much to work with. So you're not going to make as much as you would have. Same policy, same dividend rate, but you're not going to make as much because the policy design sucked. So that's why the most important thing that you can focus on, I'm getting ahead, is the ratio of the cash value to the premium. All right, so let's pull it all together now. I wanna show you what everything looks like when we look at them side by side. And again, I don't have the internal rates of return on here, but I just wanna graph the cash values and the death benefits for the two different policies side by side so you can visualize what's going on here. So if we look at this graph, um, first just take note of that the warm colors, the red and the yellow, represent the, the two death benefits. The death benefit in red is the minimum funded life insurance policy where we're trying to maximize the death benefit. So you can see that that is just over $2 million and it's for the life of the insured at that $2 million. The yellow is the death benefit for the maximum overfunded policy design. And the reason that this one is going up is that in order to maximum overfund the policy, if we're going to put seven or twenty thousand dollars of premium into a policy each year, then we need to keep that same increment of death benefit each year as well. So as the cash value grows, you, you can notice there that the, the gap between the yellow line and the blue line remains constant. And the blue line represents the, the cool colors represent the cash values of the two policies. So the blue line represents the cash value of the maximum overfunded policy. And you can see that that corridor or gap between the death benefit and the cash value remains constant with that death benefit, of additional death benefit of about $300,000. So one thing that is noteworthy here is if you look out towards the 79, 80, Time frame, the death benefit crosses over the death benefit of the minimally funded policy. And this is kind of significant because you're paying the exact same amount of money each year and you've got a whole lot more cash value to, to work with, but yet you don't have the coverage in the early years. So if you've ever heard the adage of buy term and invest the difference, here is a strong case for buy term and life insurance, permanent life insurance. So you, you could buy a cheaper term policy to cover you for 20 or 30 years to get you out to that point where the death benefit crosses over 
and you could probably do that for much cheaper than what you could have done. I shouldn't say you, you I, I won't, I can't say that you could do it for cheaper, as you can see here. I mean, you'd be paying twenty thousand dollars in each case, but you'd have a whole lot more that you could do with that cash while you're paying for that term policy. So. Not making a case for buying two policies, but you can see the value of that because the you know once it drops off, you're still going to have much more death benefit continuing to rise each year thereafter. And finally, let's look down at the green line now. The green line represents the cash value in that minimally funded policy that we're looking at. So again, the the reason that the death benefit IRR was so high was because for very little investment or premium, you're getting a very large death benefit. The IRR on the maximum overfunded policy was very low because you got a very low potential payout in exchange for that same investment. So, you know, again, the, the point here is two policies with the exact same premium can have vastly different internal rates of return. It's all about, for the double play, it's all about how much cash you can put to work in two places at one time. So before I move on and conclude this, I just look, look at the cash value of the minimally funded policy compared to the death benefit of the minimally funded policy. And one thing that you heard me describe in, in a lot of my videos is, you know, the, the cash value of a life insurance policy is, is quite literally the policy owner saving up the death benefit on the insured over the insured's expected lifetime. And you can see that that green line is, is Every year, I mean, it's closing up the gap, but that gap represents how much money, or that death, benefit, that death benefit needs to be covered, you know, costs money. The insurance company needs to take from the cash value to put into a pool to pay all the expected claims for those, say, 45 year olds who aren't going to make it to 46. And you can see that the cost of insurance in the minimally funded policy is probably five to six times the cost of insurance in the maximum overfunded policy, simply because there's that much more death benefit or risk to the insurance company of having to pay that out. So each year as the cash value increases, the risk to the insurance company goes down. But if, if you just simply look at the area between the red and the green compared to the area between the yellow and the blue, um, there's a whole lot more risk and cost in the minimally funded life insurance policy. Much more benefit to the insured if they last live that long, but certainly not if they live past 78, 79, right? There, they would have been better off with the maximum overfunded policy. So insurance is there to protect you when you're young is, is the, the point here. All right, so what should you be looking at? You know, I've shown you what you shouldn't be using for evaluating a policy, the IRR, but so what should you be looking at? Well, if it's not obvious from what I've said so far, you, you want a policy that maximizes the cash value and minimizes the expenses. So you want, at, when, when you're putting $20,000 a year of premium to a policy and you intend to leverage the cash value for investing in real estate, it doesn't matter what the IRR is. You simply want to make sure that you're getting the most cash value that you could put to work in two places at one time. I mean, ideally, it'd be nice if you could put $20,000 into a bank account and turn around and get a $20,000 line of credit from the bank that's secured by your bank deposit, but it doesn't work that way. So life insurance is this very unique asset class where you can, I mean, it's literally written into the state statutes in all 50 states that insurance companies must make loans to their policy owners secured by the cash value of those policies. So they have to give you a loan. So you, if you wanna get as big a loan as possible, you need to make sure that your policy has the maximum cash value. So it has to be designed right up to that uh, minimum definition of life insurance where you're just barely buying enough death benefit protection to meet that minimum definition of life insurance. And you wanna just make sure that those costs inside the policy are minimized. Secondly, the next thing that you wanna look at is what is the dividend rate? And honestly, we don't know what the dividend rates are going to be 
10, 20, 30 years out into the future. What you should keep in mind is that the insurance companies are investing in the debt markets. So they're buying bonds and treasuries and mortgage-backed certificates, preferred stocks. They're making loans against real estate. So interest rates on those investments move up and move down with the economy. So we have a good idea of what they invest in and what they're going to make, what it's backed up by. We just don't know exactly what it's going to be in any year. So my recommendation to you is if you're having multiple agents or run, run illustrations for you, or if you're looking at multiple companies, make sure that the, whatever the rate is that they use, knowing that it's not going to be accurate anyway, make sure that it's apples to apples. So find the lowest common denominator. If, if the, like say mass mutual is paying a 6% dividend and some other companies paying a 5% dividend, make sure that the mass mutual policy is run at 5%. See what it looks like side by side with the other policy. If you've got two illustrations that are designed for maximum overfunding and they both have exact same growth rates, the one that actually looks better over time has lower fees inside of it. And I hope that's apparent to you. So that's the one you would want to use because that's the one that's going to give you more cash value that you can turn around and leverage. So I hope that's clear. Um, you know, the purpose of this video was to show you why the IRR is a useless metric when you're investing in real estate using a maximum overfunded life insurance policy. It's all about the real estate investment that you're making not the life insurance. Um, I also call, talked about you know different things that you can you should be looking at, which is one, the the different metrics that you should be looking at um, when when you are evaluating policy. So, the ratio of cash value to premium, and the dividend rates. And just again, the point with the dividends is just make sure they're apples to apples so that you can get at what the internal expenses are. So that's all I have on this topic. If you're hungry for more information and you're not ready to talk to a life insurance agent yet, I highly recommend going out to Facebook and look for the double play group there. And that's a group that I set up and it's a community of people who are doing the double play. Um, some of them are my clients, some of them aren't. Um, there are also people there who have policies and just wanna learn what the double play is all about. And it's people who just want to simply learn how it works. So there's tons of information there and you can ask questions in a forum where people are actually doing this and you don't have to talk to a scary life insurance agent. I also want to point out that there are tons of resources available on my website that correspond to this particular topic. So there's, a, there's going to be a link in the description down below and there's a corresponding blog post that goes along with this. Uh, this topic as well as you, the ability to download all the slides that I, I show here and be sure to check out the rest of the website uh, I consider it to be a no fluff zone meaning it's all good solid information it's not you know bare minimum and pretty pictures that they just simply want to capture your email address and so they can bombard you with marketing everything that you need to know to understand the double play how to invest in real estate using life insurance is there for you. Again, the, the only time you should ever have to call me or any other life insurance agent is when you wanna actually see the numbers for yourself. And if, if you enjoy getting all this free content, please consider supporting this channel at buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description and your support for this channel provides me an incentive to keep making these videos available to you for free. So with that, I will see you in the next video.